Okay, that's, that's all right. Okay, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, when I was asked by the organizers, uh, Pete van Isaka and uh, Kasten, uh, for giving this uh, lecture, I was a little bit surprised because I'm not a theoretician, I'm an experimentalist. What do you think I am? And, <laughs> yes. And Augusto. And, and Jan. And Jan. Uh, <laughs> but since I was in a good company, I accepted this. Um, and I will discuss today um, theory on uh, collective nuclei at the shape phase transition point and beyond. Um, and I want to give also uh, quite a number of experimental data to compare the theories to. So you will see today more data than you have seen before, probably for two reasons, because I think uh, some of you are also experimentalists and uh, you want to see how the theory that you study here really works in, uh, in nature. And secondly, I also think that the uh, theoreticians among you uh, should know how to obtain the data that you do your theory on. Uh, so I was helped uh, in the by putting together this presentation by Dr. Bella and Dr. Krugman, two postdocs of mine, and Dr. Krugman is also with us, uh, and uh, he will also help you and me uh, when we do the exercises in the afternoon. Uh, <coughs> so here's a outline of my presentation. I will remind you briefly at what you have studied already during this week, um, or during these days here, uh, on the rigid rotor and nuclear deformation a little bit. Then I motivate uh, the phenomenon of a shape phase transition and discuss the X5 solution um, that is an analytic solution to the geometrical model uh, close to or at the uh, point uh, in the nuclear charge where uh, vibrational nuclei turn into deformed nuclei as a function of uh, increasing particle number. Uh, then I will discuss at more length um, variant of this X or generalization of this uh, analytic solution, which is also analytic as a parameter more, this confined better soft rotor model. Uh, and um, the main physics in these models is the physics of a uh, evolution of deformation in a soft potential, uh, which causes this phenomenon of centrifugal stretching. And uh, I will show you evidences for this phenomenon from spectroscopic data, from level energies, and also from uh, decay transition rates, electromagnetic transition rates, rates, which means lifetime data on some nuclei, and then I will discuss some, if, if I have time, uh, some uh, electric monopole transitions and then conclude. So when you do nuclear structure studies, I mean, you do some spectroscopy on nuclei uh, with high resolution. You can do gamma ray spectroscopy, let's say, with germanium detectors. And then you see typically uh, in a nuclear reaction these sort of gamma ray spectra you can recognize uh, several gamma ray transitions here. Some are very prominent, and you see also regular features. Uh, here I have labeled a few gamma rays. I mean, this is a, that is an even, even nucleus, Erbium 160, is deformed, and you have gamma ray transitions from a 2 plus to the ground state 0 plus, 4 to 2, 6 to 4, 8 to 6, 10 to 8. So this is like a, a band of transitions uh, that, that are also in coincidence. <coughs> so they belong to the same structure. And you can uh, study angular distributions, uh, you can study coincidence relations, and then come up with a level scheme, a, a, a scheme of uh, excited states and gamma ray transitions that connect them. And here again, this example from this uh, nucleus here, Erbium 160, there's a, as an even, even nucleus, it clearly has a zero plus ground state. And then there are states on top of this, uh, 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus, so the ground state band. And then there are side bands also, I mean, that come from gamma ray transitions in between here with weaker intensity. There's a band that starts with a 2 plus and has also the odd uh, spin numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. 
this is the so-called gamma band, and then there is a band that is based on a zero plus. Mm. Uh, this is here dash because it wasn't seen in that experiment, but it was known before. So zero, two, four, six looks like the ground band, uh, the k equals zero band, and uh, there are decays into the ground band and also in this band. Uh, and you want to make sense uh, of, of this level scheme. And one important um, <coughs> number that characterizes these deformed nuclei that you have learned already from uh, Professor Kasten is this ratio of excitation energies from the first 4 plus to the first 2 plus, this R42 ratio, which in this case here is 3.1. <coughs> Why do I say this? Uh, because uh, there is uh, this rigid rotor uh, uh, paradigm, uh, which I will discuss in a, in a minute. Here's a, another example of such a ground state band uh, disclosing 164, uh, where this R42 ratio is larger. So these R42 ratios can vary between different nuclei. Um, and here are the level energies. So in this case, the 242 kV divided by 73.4, that is 3.30. Um, not exactly 3.33. Uh, why do I say 3.33? Because one very easy uh, theory you can compare this to is the rigid rotor theory, where you just have uh, angular momentum, the L square operator, and that produces uh, eigenenergies that are proportional to LL plus 1 or II plus 1. Um, and if you would normalize, so you have this H bar square over 2 theta, the moment of inertia in front, and if you normalize this number uh, to the experimentally observed level energy 73.4 kV in this disposium 164, then this II plus 1 rule would then predict <laughs> these energies here. So while it was adjusted to the data at this point, I mean, you see that it fits quite well, 244.7 instead of 242. But then you start to notice also there are some deviations. I mean, here you are already 5% off, and here you are more than 10% off. Um, <coughs> so the nuclei look like rigid rotors, but they are not exactly rigid rotors. Yeah, there, are, there are differences. Um, as I said before, so the rotational energy of the rigid rotor is II plus 1 times a constant. And rigid rotor means this moment of inertia does not change along the band. It's just rigid. It doesn't matter how, how fast you spin the nucleus. Uh, its moment of inertia stays constant. It's independent of the angular momentum. And in that case, so if that holds, then you have a ratio of the first 4 plus, where you have here 4 times 5, divided by the first 2 plus, uh, where you have here 2 times 3. That is exactly 3.33. Uh, and uh, this constant in front drops out because this constant was identical for all the, the same levels. And you have seen disposing 164, quite a good rotor. Uh, deviated a little bit uh, from, from this prediction. Another example here, uranium-236, also a strongly deformed nucleus. Um, uh, there are deviations I have plotted here. It's, it's first to plus has a different energy, of course. It, it is at, at 45.2 kV. Uh, but I have adjusted the scale such that the, the 2 plus uh, bars here, they are all at the same height. And then uh, the 4 plus, you see then the, the, the energy here, you, you can compare the bars. Uh, they start to deviate from the rigid rotor in the same way as uh, this posing 164 has deviated. And uh, it happens that also the R42 ratio here are identical between this posing 164 and uranium 236. Very close, 1% within the rigid rotor limit, but when you arrive at the 10 plus or 12 plus, the deviations are already uh, 10, 15 percent from the rigid rotor formula. So there must be something in addition uh, to, this, to this rigid rotation. Uh, <coughs> you have 
studied already the Bohr Hamiltonian. Uh, here, uh, Professor Caprio has uh, uh, discussed this topic a lot. So uh, I just put it up because I mean we were we are discussing the behavior of these spinning nuclei in terms of the Bohr Hamiltonian, where we uh, consider the, the shape of the nucleus, this quadrupole deformed shape, and its its orientation, and you can. Uh, then uh, go to the intrinsic frame, which means you, uh, you go to a coordinate system that is fixed to the uh, deformation axis of the nucleus, and then you have two parameters, two uh, dynamic variables, that is the quadrupole deformation parameter beta and this triaxiality parameter gamma. Uh, <coughs> So you have a kinetic energy term here, you have a centrifugal term there, and a potential in terms of these uh, deformation variables, beta and gamma. So th this is a centrifugal term. I mean, uh, that is traditionally written Q here, but you can also write angular momentum L, L square, in the different directions. Uh, and you see the moment of inertia, I mean, that is typically L square over theta, so the, the moment of inertia in this Bohr Hamiltonian, that is proportional to beta square. So uh, in the if you compare this to the rigid rotor constraint, which was uh, theta must be constant for all angular momento, momenta, then you, you see that the Bohr Hamiltonian can be consistent only with the rigid rotor if you fix beta for every state independently of the angular momentum by the potential, and this you can do exactly only if the potential would be a delta function in, in, in beta at a certain beta zero, right? So if you, if you would have a potential as a function of beta which would be infinite everywhere and only at a certain beta zero, you would allow to have finite values. Well, you don't have to switch on the light. Um, where you have finite values of beta, and that would keep beta uh, for all the states with angular momentum at, at that rigid value beta zero. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, maybe I need it later. <coughs> Of course, a potential as a delta function that is quite unphysical. <coughs> uh, another nucleus, another data set, Samari 152, which has historically played a, a very important role. Um, there is this ground band, the R42 ratio is 3.01, but as before, also in other nuclei, there are other bands, like here is another k equals 0 band with a 0 plus, 2 plus, 4 plus, and other states. Um, and here, this, uh, uh, this band has an R42 ratio by itself. It is 2.69. And the 0 plus state is close in excitation energy to the 6 plus here and has an excitation energy relative to the first 2 plus of 5.62. So it's 5.62 times higher in energy than the first 2 plus state. Uh, <coughs> Nuclear deformations, so we have seen nuclear with different alpha 2 values. Nuclear deformations evolve over the nuclear chart. Uh, and here is a plot of uh, where you can find in the nuclear chart, so proton number, neutron number, the different uh, deformations. I mean, this is the area of the rare earth nuclei with strong uh, quadrupole deformations. Here are the, the actinides with strong quadrupole deformations. I have shown you examples from these regions. And then you see the magic numbers where you have uh, small deformations, vibrational nuclei, and then you have regions where uh, these deformations change quite rapidly as a function of particle number. Uh, this is uh, R ratio, uh, the R42 ratios in, uh, in such a region of rapidly changing deformation. So you have uh, values from 2, which I think you have seen this graph already from Professor Kasten, in the samarium isotopes going from, one, from 146 samarium to 160 samarium. So these values go from nearly 2 to close to 3.33. 3. 
and in terms of this potential uh, as a function of beta, <coughs> you go from a, a parabola, a harmonic oscillator, uh, so beta square, to something which is close to a delta function. I mean, that is not really a delta function, but there's a strong minimum at a certain finite value of beta. And if you want to go smoothly from here to there, I mean, you must somehow lower the potential uh, at, at a finite value of beta, and uh, then you must encounter a situation where the low value at beta equals zero and this low value uh, of the potential at a finite beta, they are almost equal. Right? So you must encounter in this evolution a situation where you have a sort of a flat bottom here and then a steep rise at the, at the side. Uh, and this uh, is a situation which uh, was discussed later from, uh, in, the, in the last 15 years or so as a, a critical point of a shape phase transition, a, a shape transition which goes from spherical vibrational to more or less rigidly deformed. Um, and uh, there is an analytic solution to such a transition, uh, an analytic theoretical solution to the Bohr Hamiltonian, which is called the X5 solution, which I will discuss uh, from now on uh, in, in much more detail. And uh, here are uh, the parameter-free predictions of this analytic solution. Um, there, is, there are a few characteristics. I mean, there is a R42 ratio, <laughs> and this analytic solution, which I will discuss in the next slide, um, gives a number of 2.90. So for the energy of the first four plus to the energy of the first two plus is 2.90. And in the excited k equals zero band, this ratio is 2.80. And there's an analytic and a parameter-free prediction of this model is also that there occurs a zero-plus state close to the six-plus state in the ground band uh, with a relative excitation energy uh, to the first two-plus of 5.65. And here's again the samarium data that I have shown you before, uh, where this R42 ratio deviates from the rigid road in the ground band, 3.0, much closer to the 2.9 to the analytic, to the parameter-free prediction of this model, uh, the R42 ratio in the excited k equals zero band is lower than the, that in the ground band, as here in this, in this model, and the excitation energy of the excited zero plus is close to the six plus of the ground band, and uh, the relative excitation energy to the first two plus is 5.6, like, like here. So there is uh, some evidence that this solution, which I will discuss now, uh, really has, uh, uh <coughs> I mean, occurs in, in nature. Uh, and these data, by the way, they were found by Professor Kasten. And others. And others. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is now this uh, X5 theory uh, that you, I hope that you want to learn now and you want to study? Uh, that was uh, found and developed by uh, Professor Iacello at, at Yale University, as I said, about 15 years ago. So that is uh, what I said in words already, a wave function of uh, the, the geometrical model uh, in the laboratory system that depends on uh, five variables three angles, the Euler angles, of the orientation of the deformed nucleus, and two intrinsic variables of the quadrupole deformation uh, in the intrinsic frame, this beta and gamma. And that is written here already in a way where one assumes that uh, the beta deformation and the gamma deformation are separable. Uh, uh, Professor Caprio has discussed this. So the, the Euler angles you can parameterize, I mean, uh, or write as in terms of these d functions. So we only have to to deal with the intrinsic variables here, and uh, we assume that beta and gamma is separable, 
and uh, gamma can be treated in this case here in the X5 solution, let's say, as a harmonic oscillator. Uh, we, we will not deal with gamma. The, the thing we focus on is the, is the beta. And then <coughs> the Bohr Hamiltonian uh, transforms into this radial equation uh, as, as written here. So there is a constant with a mass parameter in front, h bar square over 2b. And then there is this uh, kinetic term, 1 over beta to the force, d over d beta, beta to the force, d over d beta. Uh, and then comes the centrifugal term, minus 1 over 3 beta square LL plus 1. So this is the, the L square operator. <coughs> plus the potential in terms of beta. Uh, and then, it, I mean, it's an eigen equation, of course. So there's a wave function, which we call xi. Xi sub L with an index L that is the, uh, that is the index for the angular momentum state you are, you are looking at, 0 plus 2 plus or 4 plus, uh, is equal to the eigen energy times the eigen function, so the eigen equation. And at the critical point, we said that uh, we encountered the situation where the minimum of the potential at beta equals 0 and at a large value of beta are equal. And, <coughs> and then there is a steep rise. And the simplest way to model this, and which also give then gives then an analytic solution, is to use an infinite square well potential. So you have a low value at beta equals 0, a flat bottom, a low value at a, a finite large beta, and then a steep rise. Right? And the simplest way you can do it, you have a flat bottom and then an infinite high wall. Which means, <coughs> so everywhere where the potential is infinite, that means that the quantum mechanical wave function cannot live there. It, it, can, it can tunnel into forbidden parts of the, of the parameter space, but not to regions where the potential is infinite. I mean, there the wave function must be exactly zero. That means there are at least boundary conditions for the wave function. The wave function can live only in, in this part of, of beta. Uh, so from they can contain uh, values of beta that range from beta equals zero to some finite large value of beta. But they cannot contain pieces with other values of beta. And wave functions must be continuous if they are zero in the, p in the parts where the potential is infinite. Then uh, the wave functions must have nodes at the boundaries. They must go to zero because they must be continuous. And when they are zero outside, they must be zero at the, bo at the, at the borders. So there are boundary conditions. And these boundary conditions are written here, so the wave function xi for every angular momentum state L must be zero at this beta wall. Beta w means the, the, the where, the, where the wall starts. Right? <coughs> and of course, at zero, there must also be zero. So then uh, you, you have this quite complicated uh, differential equation with that boundary condition, and you want to solve it. And the miracle is, and you will prove it in this afternoon in the exercises, that this is not a miracle but just mathematics, if you now change variables, instead of using these eigenfunctions xi, you use new functions xi tilde that are simply the old xi's multiplied by the deformation variable to the power of 3 halves. And you change the variable beta itself to a new variable z, or z, uh, which is a square root of parameters that appear here, the eigenenergy and this, this constant here in front, times beta. Then this equation transforms into the Bessel equation. The Bessel equation has been studied I think in the 19th century, but I'm not absolutely sure, by mathematicians for some other reasons. It's just an interesting differential equation. Uh, and the, the solutions to the Bessel equation are the Bessel functions, and they are tabulated in mathematical textbooks. So, so, so this, this differential equation is complicated, but it's solved. The solutions are known, and they are tabulated. You cannot 
solve it uh, in, in closed analytic form, but these Bessel functions you can, you can find and you can plot. And in Mathematica, for instance, I mean, you can have uh, uh, tools for just showing the Bessel functions and then you can, you can look at it. I, I will show you in a minute. Yes. Of beta w, what is the yeah. meaning? Of, oh, the v v of beta, that is a potential. Just that is to define boundary conditions. Uh, ah, well, yeah. we, we we said before. Um, when you have when you have a harmonic oscillator, you have v of beta is proportional to beta square. Right? When you have a rigid rotor. V of beta is like a delta function of in terms of beta, minus delta beta minus beta zero. That is a rigid rotor. And you now we wanted to have a, a potential for beta at the shape phase transition point, where you have a low value at beta equals zero, a low value at a finite beta, and then a steep rise. Then we take this potential. So V of beta is our is our square well. So the, the, the white part is the allowed stuff. So here the wave function can live, but this here is infinite. Okay, so, so let me write it up. V of beta is equal to zero for beta between, between zero and some finite value, which I call beta w. And it is infinite otherwise. Beta larger beta w. Okay? Yeah, so this model is for uh, just for the it's transition, transition. It's at the critical point, yeah. exactly. It's yeah. And it's so it's just for this and it's not flexible, right? You you cannot change it in this model. So so you have one potential, you can and you can solve it. <coughs> Are there other questions? You can when something is unclear, please ask me. Okay. So now we do this transformation of variables of, of beta into z, which is a constant times beta, and this wave function psi as into psi tilde, and then we get the Bessel functions, the, uh, the Bessel equation. The Bessel equation is the second derivative of your function, so y2 prime, well, psi tilde 2 prime, plus the first derivative divided by the, by the variable, plus 1 minus a constant in square divided by the variable in square, times the function itself is 0. That is the Bessel equation. And the solution to the Bessel differential equation are the Bessel functions. <coughs> and the Bessel functions, they have uh, an index here, and that is just this number, this constant that appears in this Bessel function. And in our case, this constant here is, you do this, you verify this in the afternoon in the exercises, square root of the parameter that appears here, LL plus 1 divided by 3 plus 9 quarters, 9, nine fourths. So I, I cannot help it. It just turns out from this, from this um, transformation of variables. What are now the Bessel functions? Here are the Bessel functions. Uh, in, in one example, in the simplest case, uh, or in, in one case, um, for the case, for the ground state, L is zero. So when you have angular momentum zero, then of course the K quantum number must be zero. Why is that so? We, we, what? Yes? Exactly, it's a projection on the symmetry axis, so when you project a, a, a zero vector, then the, the projection is zero. So k quantum number is zero, so this is zero. L is zero, so this is zero here. So for the L equals zero state, then this square root reduces to square root of 9 over 4, which is very convenient. 9 over 4 you can solve uh, in your mind, so it's 3 half, so 1.5. Right? So this is the Bessel function j 1.5 of the variable z, right? or of x, or whatever you, you write here. So, so this is a z-axis here. And this is the Bessel function uh, j 1.5. Uh, there is a 
second type of Bessel function, the Bessel functions of second kind, um, the Bessel so this is the y function. This, the j functions are the Bessel functions of first kind. The difference is um, they, the Bessel function of first kind start at zero for the variable being zero, and the Bessel function of second kind, they start at minus infinity at the variable uh, at z equals zero. And then they are oscillatory, and they oscillate with the same frequency. <coughs> um, but you remember that we had these boundary conditions, the wave functions must be zero at the variable being zero. That means the solution can only be the Bessel function of the first kind, because that is the function uh, which, has, which starts at zero for the variable being zero. Right? So there cannot be a contribution of the Bessel function of second kind, which is, uh, both are solutions of the Bessel equation. But uh, the, the wave functions we are looking for only contain these Bessel functions of first kind. Okay, so we now know that the solutions of this Bessel equation here are these Bessel functions with this, which, with this index which changes from, uh, from level to level because L changes. So the angular momentum is zero, two, four, and then does this, this index change and also these Bessel functions change slightly? Yes? So this, the definition of D changed from slide to slide? This one has no That definition. is correct. The, 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 the definition of this new changes from state to state because the angular momentum L changes from state to state. You see here in the, in the Bohr-Hamiltonian there appears this L, L plus one. I think you meant in the next slide there's a minus k squared in the definition. Uh, oh. Ah, okay. <coughs> this is a generalization to the cases where you can have k not equal zero. So what I have written here is I was interested, uh, I have written it up for, the, for k equal zero bands. But if you have also k not being zero, we only deal today with k equal zero bands, so do, don't worry. But, but the other, the other equation here that was more general. If you also consider gamma bands with k equal 2 or k equal 4 bands, then you must modify this. Uh, it's, it's then more general. You can also, ah, I, at one point I will also discuss a, a gamma band and then I have used this index. Yeah. <coughs> so this is more general and in case of k equal 0 that reduces to the other formula that I have shown before. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we have the solution but we haven't dealt yet with the boundary equation, with the boundary conditions. So our boundary condition was that the wave function must vanish at zero. This we have dealt with already by, by, by having the Bessel function of first kind only. But we also have the condition that the wave function must be zero at the wall. Okay, so we can, we can use only those uh, uh, solutions that produce a zero for the parameter z being the being the value at the at the at the wall. So where you plug in here where's the definition of z. So there's here this constant which came with the Bohr Hamiltonian and there's the eigenenergy which we still don't know though times beta. But when we plug in here the beta the position of the infinite wall then uh, and we put it into the Bessel function, then this must be zero because that is our boundary condition. <coughs> okay, but the Bessel function has zeros. Here's a zero, a first zero, there's a second zero, and so on and so forth. So that means that this number here, this zw, so when we plug in here this, this beta at the wall, this must be a zero of the Bessel function with that index. And that means that we have, for a given potential with a, with a width beta w, and parameters of the Bohr Hamiltonian, this mass parameter, we know we can read off this zero of the Bessel uh, equation with that particular index, and then we can calculate the eigenenergy for every level as a function of the angular momentum L. 
and as a function of which zero of the Bessel function we take, right? Uh, so we know that this z w or z s l you can you can you can classify them as a uh, in terms of the nodes of the Bessel function and the angular momentum. Uh, is equal to this constant here times beta w. You, you can solve for the eigenenergies, which we do here. So you square it and then you solve for this. So then you have a constant for the, the energy of the S state with angular momentum L is a constant times the square of the zeros of a Bessel function with a certain index. Yes? And now we have, now, now we have produced solutions for, for a spectrum, which I will plot in a minute. So here you're looking for the zeros of the Bessel function, mm -hmm. so you can get the energy eigenstates? That's correct. So from the boundary condition, we get yeah. the eigenstates. Why, why did you show us the second side of Bessel function? Uh, please wait a few minutes. <laughs> I will need it later. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, another question? Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I will discuss it now. I, I will show you now. So, you want the excitation energy of the S state, take the S as a first, okay? Then it's uh, the ground band. You want the energy of the first state with angular momentum L. Take L equal zero, then you have the ground state. So that's the first zero plus state. Then, uh, well, uh, so, so if you have the, f the first state with angular momentum L, then you have as an excitation energy, that is the absolute energy of that state minus the ground state, of course. The ground state is the first state with angular momentum L equals zero. So S is one, L is zero. And that means you have this constant in front times the square of the first zero of the Bessel function with angular momentum L. Remember, this index nu was a function of L minus the square of the first zero of the Bessel function with angular momentum zero. Okay, so now you have the excitation energy. You can calculate, let's say, the excitation energy of the first two plus state. Okay, then for the first two plus state, that is the first, so S is one, the first zero of the Bessel function, angular momentum L. That means in this nu of L, there appears now a uh, 2 times 2 plus 1, minus the ground state energy. Then you have the excitation energy of the first 2 plus, which is just this constant times the square of the first zero of the Bessel function with, uh, wh where you have used the angular momentum L, minus the square of the first zero of the Bessel function where you have used the angular momentum L equals 0. These numbers you can read of a mathematical textbook or you use Mathematica, and this is just a constant from this Bohr Hamiltonian. Or, even simpler, you want to get rid of this constant, so you take, you take ratios. Then, I mean, there's the same constant here for the excitation energy of the first two plus, then here for the excitation energy of the S L plus. You just divide them, so then this constant drops out, and all energy ratios are just determined by squares of zeros of Bessel functions. So you cannot change them anymore. Right? So, so it's there. You have no flexibility. That's a, it's just an analytic solution, which happens to be this one. So when you do this, and you will do this in the afternoon, I will give you a table with zeros of Bessel functions. And you just compute these sort of ratios of differences of squares of Bessel functions. And that give you relative excitation energies. So when you plug them, when you, when you read off the mathemat mathematical textbook these zeros of the Bessel functions and you do this ratio here, then you find you have uh, the 2 plus at some energy, so that would be at relative energy 1, and then the 4 plus you plug in here here a different zero of the Bessel function, then you find this ratio is 2.90.
When you put the 6 plus, you get something else, close to 5.5. .5. You can, instead of using the first note of the Bessel function, let me go back to the Bessel function again, here. So instead, uh, so, so we are on this Bessel function here, right? Bessel function of first kind. Instead of reading off the first note of the Bessel function, you can also use the second note of the Bessel function, which has a higher value. So that produces a higher excited state, also with the same angular momentum, which is this one. So there's another zero plus. Uh, this one was the first zero plus. That is another zero plus. And then there will be higher zero pluses, right? Corresponding to the third zero of the Bessel function, to the fourth zero of the Bessel function, and so on and so forth. These Bessel functions are oscillatory. So you have an infinite amount of zero pluses that have higher and higher and higher excitation energies and more and more nodes. Okay? Okay. So, uh, and, and that is how it compared to data. So this is the parameter free solution of the Bohr-Hamiltonian with this particular potential now, right? You have previously studied, I mean, a, a rigid rotor or a vibrator. Now you have this funny potential, an infinite square well. Solutions of the infinite square well problems are always Bessel functions. And <coughs> you have, for this potential, you have this solution, which is parameter-free and fixed. And you can compare it to data. And these there are also these arrows, they are E2 transitions, which I will discuss later, and they also compare more or less favorable uh, to, to, I mean, from between data and this, and this, and this model. So, uh, yes. What is the, the meaning of the parameter free? The meaning of parameter free is that in the Hamiltonian, a square well potential has no scale because infinite is scaleless. Right? Uh, uh, there is no meaning into having having the potential twice as large because two times infinity is also infinity. <coughs> uh, and and then the, all the other parameters that appear in the Hamiltonian here. So the, the potential doesn't have a parameter. It's besides this, this, this width of the potential. And here's another parameter, this b. Uh, this doesn't play a role for the relative excitation energies because these parameters of the, of the problem drop out when you take ratios. In this relative excitation energies, there is no parameter of the Bohr-Hamiltonian anymore. Right? So it's completely independent. You, you can change the parameters. These relative excitation energies are still the same. So you make the, the width of the potential twice as large. You make the mass parameter 100 times as large. Then the relative excitation energies are still the same, exactly the same. So it's independent of the parameters that you have put into the equation. The relative excitation energies stay the same. Only the scale, the scale here, that's, that changes when you change the parameters. So <coughs> in that sense, relative excitation energies and relat also relative E2s are parameter free. And here are relative things, so, so these numbers are parameter free. Yeah? Something which I'm always disturbed to as using those analysis rules is that it's okay, you take this relative energy, but if you would take now the relative energy of the second two plus in the second zero plus over the first two plus over the first zero plus, you don't have ideas. That is correct. The moment of inertia that is correct. Yes, yes. Yes. I think the, the moment of inertia, there's a problem in the geometrical model. Yeah. I agree. Because, <laughs> in my opinion, when you, do, when you do an intrinsic excitation, you do something to the, to the, to the <coughs> superfluid uh, stuff, right? Uh, so you, you increase the moment of inertia. So you break pairing assault, or, you, or you reduce the pairing. <coughs> but this is outside of the geometrical model. You cannot, descri you cannot describe it in here. I mean, you know that it, I mean it, from the English formula, you have to go to the, to the uh, underlying particles. Yeah? So uh, in this F5 model, so you have these infinite square wells, and then you have different 
Enes becomes El Valium because he drank, he, he, he noticed so for 14 <coughs> take different views of the uh, of the vessel function. Vessel function. You, you take first, you take, fi for different L's, you take different vessel functions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. They, they have a different index. So Okay. Mm -hmm. In different solution, you should s the mean value would be slightly going. To I will the show value. you this. I will show you this. Just wait. Yes, you are completely right. I will, th 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 this will come. I mean, please be a little bit patient. So, so mm, okay. Why? So the agreement is good. Why the agreement is good? Yeah. Because because, because we believe that. Samari 152 is lying close to this here. This value, 3.01, that is the value for Samari 152. And we believe that the shape phase transition point is somewhere here, probably a little bit before Samari 152. So uh, for, for these nuclei here, only here, the potential looks somehow close to this flat thing and then a steep rise. Not exactly, of course, therefore it wasn't exact, right? but, but <coughs> that is closest to that point. And I mean, we turn it around, we have a solution for a situation with, with that potential and we find Samari 152 being quite close to this prediction. So that means, uh, do you have a question on this topic, Rick? No, <laughs> okay, that's what I, uh, what I was afraid of. Okay, so Rick. Has <laughs> the okay, so, so, so we conclude that 152 samarium is lying close to this shape phase transition point. Rick. Remember what I said in one of my first lectures, that these collective models cannot tell you why a nucleus does what it does. It can tell you what it does. And so we find that the nucleus does something roughly similar to this potential. To find out why, you have to do a microscopic calculation. And there have been microscopic calculations by Dario Bretina and his group. And they show that the potentials are pretty Are you going to discuss the bump? Yes, uh, well, here's threatening us. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, ju just wait. So <coughs> there is another, uh, there are other nuclei that agree quite well with this prediction. Neodymium-150, which is an isotone to Samar-152, has an R4-2 ratio of 2.93, which is within a percent equal to this uh, X5 prediction. And the excited zero plus state here is also very close to the situation where it is predicted. But the moment of inertia is different. And then there are higher excited bands also. And also the B2 values are sort of close from the trend to, to, uh, to the prediction. There are some disagreements, but <coughs> quite good. So we have seen nuclei that have different R42 values. And some of them have an R42 value close to <coughs> 2.9, which is the prediction of X5. And then also the location of the z excited zero plus state is predicted. So you can, you can correlate these two observ observables and compare data and theory. So X5 makes a prediction for R42, makes a prediction for R02. So in this figure, it is a, it is a dot somewhere, right? And the, and this dot lies here. And these squares, uh, diamonds, are data from nuclei in that region that we have looked at. Uh, I mean, this uh, beginning of the, of the rare earth nuclei. And you see <coughs> nuclei with varying R42 values and also with varying excitation energies of the zero plus state, but they show a, a smooth systematics, right? So, of course, this parameter-free model can only produce one, one dot here. And it lies in the band of the data, th which is good already, so it, it shows that it is relevant. But, of course, you cannot describe all these nuclei because you cannot change this model. It's g it just makes one prediction. Now we do different. Why? Because, I mean, here is the... the potentials that were calculated microscopically for some neodymium isotopes. Neodymium-150 is here this thick black line. 
Here is beta equals zero. This is a quadrupole par parameter, but you can read it as beta, the deformation variable. Beta equals zero, and beta equal 20 <coughs> in, in some units. And you have a flat bottom in the potential and then a steep rise. It's not exactly a square well, but if you go from 150 at the phase shape transitional point towards a more deformed nucleus, 152 neodymium, that is this brownish line here, what changes? The outer wall doesn't change at all. It stays at the same position. The inner wall increases to a, uh, to a larger values of beta. Okay, so we didn't have an inner wall yet, but we n now we produce one. That was calculated. calculated. That was calculated. Don't let me go into this because then I cannot finish my lecture, but I, I, I want to finish this. That was just the motivation for changing now my potentials. We have had before, we had an infinite square well potential going from deformation variable zero to a finite value beta w. Now, <coughs> we have seen that in order to describe more deformed nuclei, we should better change the, the location of the smallest possible values of beta. So we take away <coughs> also some parts of the, of, the, of the parameter space in beta at small values of beta. So we have an inner wall at beta small, small w, or beta, beta smaller. Here in these slides it's called beta smaller, okay? So, <coughs> oh. so now the wave functions are confined only in here. Here is infinite. Here is infinite. Po the wave function not allowed. The wave functions must only live inside here in, in, in this pot. And now there appears a parameter, namely we can change the location of this inner wall with respect to the position of the outer wall. So we look at this ratio, the position of the inner wall, beta smaller, over beta width, beta wall. And of course, this is always smaller than this one. That can range from zero when, this, when we are in the x5 situation where the inner wall is at zero. And it can go up to one, not exactly one, but close to one, which would be then the rigid rotor, because then we have a delta function in beta. So as a function of this ratio, we can now span the entire range from the critical point towards the rigid rotor limit. That is a hope, right? We have a, a large, a wide potential at the critical point. And if we close our potential, we come to the delta function situation that is a rigid rotor. So we should have all the potentials inside in order to describe this evolution from the critical point towards the rigid situation. We only have to solve this. Now it's a new potential. We have, a new, we have to solve it again. OK. So <coughs> here are the wave functions that, are, that would be allowed in this potential. So the lowest ones that have no node or the first node at this outer wall, higher excited wave functions that have, that have one node inside. Here the second node is at the wall or higher and higher and higher numbers of oscillations that correspond to <coughs> higher excitation energies. Okay, so inside this allowed area, we still have the Bessel equation, right? Because there nothing changed. Not, uh, nothing changed. Only, the only thing that has changed is there appeared a new boundary condition. Now the wave functions have to be zero at this beta value. Right, where the potential starts. New boundary condition means new conditions to the eigenenergies. So now we need the Bessel functions of second kind right, that, I have, that I have shown you before <coughs> because uh, the, the solutions to this Bessel, function, Bessel equation here will be superpositions of, in general, of Bessel functions of first kind and Bessel function of second kind with some amplitude gamma y. Right? Gamma y is, it depends on the angular momentum state. Uh, 
depends on, on this parameter, which I call here this ratio of betas, R beta. Okay, R beta is the parameter of this, of this uh, model, which is because it confines the wave function in a certain uh, uh, range of beta. It's called confined beta soft rotor. Okay, so the new boundary condition at beta smaller produces a new energy quantization, which, which, I will, which I will do now and you will calculate in the exercises. So again here you have the Bessel functions and here now this Bessel function of second kind which started off at a different value, a minus infinity for, for the variable equal zero. Uh, if you combine them, you can produce a zero at any position uh, uh, w w w which is required by the, by the potential that you have taken. So you, you choose a potential, you choose an R beta, which gives you an outer beta, w, uh, an outer value of the wall, an inner uh, location of the wall, and that, requ and that determines what uh, amplitude this Bessel function of second kind must have in order to have at this position this uh, uh, sum of first and second kind of Bessel functions to, 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 to make a zero. Okay, so this is shown here. So you have now two boundary conditions. The wave functions must vanish at the outer value and the wave function must vanish at the inner value. And the wave function is a superposition of Bessel functions of first kind and second kind. So you plug, you plug these z's into this equation here and put them to zero then you can solve for the gamma y in one equation and put it into the other. So, so for instance, you solve it for z smaller. z smaller is when you put here beta smaller or r beta times the beta wider. That is the same. Um, then, so there is this condition here. This wave function at that value of z must be zero, so then gamma y is minus this ratio of Bessel functions of first and second kind at this location. You plug this gamma y into your equation and now use the other boundary condition and that produces a new quantization condition. So, so that, that is this requirement from the, from the boundary condition on the other side. So you have plugged this into here, used that boundary condition, manipulated the formula a little bit and then you arrive at this, at this quantization condition. So the Bessel functions of first kind at the outer uh, uh, wall times the Bessel functions of the second kind at the inner wall minus the Bessel functions of first kind at the inner wall times the Bessel function of second kind at the outer wall must be zero. So you can now search for those z's that solve this quantization condition, which again will be this constant, which contains the energy eigenvalue times parameters of the Hamiltonian. And they must be zeros of this new quantization condition. And then you can solve for the eigenenergies and you get this. Formally, it's the same, it's the same uh, uh, structure as before. You have, uh, you have a constant times a square of a zero, but not of a Bessel function, but a zero of, of this combination of Bessel functions. Yeah. That's all what changed. Uh, can I have new batteries? I think. Uh, oh, can you help me with this? No. I can continue already. Uh, okay. Oh, okay, good. So, but we can, first we can uh, convince ourselves ourselves what will happen when we change um, the potential. So I have plotted here what you have said before, the wave functions, this, the, the, the wave functions here are shown for x5, okay? This is the ground state and this is the excited 12 plus because of the centrifugal uh, term increasing um, <coughs> with one over beta square. So this, the high spin states do not live at small values of beta, they live at larger values of beta. There's centrifugal stretching. So now when you change the potential 
from x5, where beta inner is 0, to, to a finite value, let's say our beta equal 0 0.4. <coughs> that means 40% of the potential are now forbidden. Thank you. Yes. And the wave functions have 60% of the original potential le left. So how will the spectrum of x5 be modified when we do this? You can tell already from, from this. So when we go from our beta equal 0 to our beta equal 0 0.4, this doesn't affect at all the wave functions of the first 12 plus state. Because the first 12 plus state that didn't live here in the space that we have forbidden now, it, it, it will not feel it. The ground state will feel it because we squeeze some pro probability of the ground state from small beta values into larger beta values, which, which means that the energy of the ground state will increase a little bit, while the energy of the first 12 plus will not. Or we look at an excited zero plus state. So here we looked into the ground state band, wave functions with no node. Now we look at excited state with the same angular momentum. This is the ground state of x5. This was the first excited zero plus state which had a node. Because it had a node and it had to be orthogonal to the ground state, it will have higher probability at larger values of beta than the ground state and also higher probability at smaller values of beta than the ground state. When we now make this region forbidden, that will affect the excited zero plus state even more than the ground state because it lived there much more from in, in the X5 situation. Right? So when we shift the wall from, from the inner wall to, the, to, to here, then we will squeeze more probability from the second zero plus state into this, into this higher deformation region. So <coughs> we expect that higher and higher excited states, I mean with more and more nodes, will be affected more and more strongly by, by changing this inner w the position of the inner wall, right? Okay, and that is how the spectra evolve. Here you see three spectra calculated for three different values of the R beta. Do you all remember what R beta is? R beta is, so here you have beta, is the position of the inner wall, that is beta smaller, to the outer wall, that is beta w. So our beta is beta inner wall divided by beta outer wall, okay? So <coughs> zero means the inner wall is at zero, that is the x5 solution. 0 0.2 means 20% of the of the region are cut away. 0.4 means 40% of the region are cut away. So let's first look at the first 12 plus. The first 12 plus, we said, will not be affected strongly because it didn't live in the region that we have cut out. And these are absolute energies here. And you see, they stay at the same positions. The, the, the 12 pluses are always at the same. The ground state will be affected a little because it lived also at this forbidden region then. So here it is low, here it is about at the same position, here it's increasing already. Okay? So the higher the spin is, the less it will be affected. That means when you increase our beta, you shift this wall, that the zero plus comes closer to the two plus, while the four plus is less affected. And if you take the R42 ratio, that is this distance divided by that distance, that this will increase because this will become more quickly smaller than this one. So, and that is what you, what you observe. You go from R42 to 2.90, which is x5, to 3.10 to 3.29 already in this case, eventually to 3.33. So when you close this, these walls, you are at 3.33 rigid rotor. So now, as a function of one parameter, we can evolve the spectra from the critical point to the rigid rotor. Yes, you have a question? No. Okay, so that was the first thing. Second thing, excited states with more and more nodes. Okay, let's take at the zero plus with one node. That is this one, this beta band. In x5, our beta equals zero, it's close to the six plus. When we close the wall, so we shift the inner wall to larger values, 
it has uh, states with more nodes will be affected more than states with one node. So all these, the ground state band has, has no node, or only, I mean, a node at the, at the boundary, at the outer boundary. This one has one inner node, so will be shifted up more quickly. This one here, the, ex the, that one, uh, the third zero plus state, so S equal three, will be shifted more quickly, goes up to high energies more quickly, right? So the, zero, the locations of the zero plus close to the six plus at x5 move somewhere between six plus and eight plus at some values of R42, close to, and, and is shifted to higher and higher energies. Here is already above the 10 plus state. Right? So the as a function of R42, the excitation energy of the first excited zero plus, of the beta band, I mean the band that has a node in the wave function in beta, will be shifted to higher and higher values. And again, this the model correlates now these numbers. So the R42 ratio and the R02 ratio are correlated by the model, uniquely correlated, and that is the red function, <coughs> the red curve here. That is the prediction of the model as a function of R beta, which is now goes from 0 to 1. Uh, you can, for, for every R beta, you can parameter free calculate the R for 2 ratio and the R0 2 ratio and make a dot. And when you connect the dots for all, for the range of R beta going from 0, that was x5, to infinity, then you get this red curve. So here's 0.4 already, and it exactly follows the data. So that is a sort of the, uh, is, uh, at least it's uh, satisfactory. Okay, so this model is somehow living uh, between the critical point and the rigid rotor. That is a, a structure triangle, a picture how, uh, or where we locate the structure of nuclei uh, uh <coughs> in, the, in terms of the geometrical model. So this corner here is the quadrupole vibrator. This corner here is the Idea, the rigid rotor limit, where you have this uh, rigid moment of inertia as a function of uh, uh, angular momentum. And this is the uh, gamma unstable case where you have soft triaxiality, <coughs> which maybe I will discuss later, but I don't think I have time. So we were discussing this region here, which is from the shape phase transitional point between a vibrator and the rigid rotor, the X5 solution, towards the rigid rotor. So that is the region where this confined beta soft rotor model can work or can be applicable. So let's look at data. I have shown you before the data for disposing 164. Here's the rigid rotor. We have seen the deviations, I mean, at the 10 plus. So that was normalized to the first two plus here, right? And 10 plus, there was already a, a deviation of, let's say, 10% or so. And here I have shown you the values for the confined beta soft rotor model where I fix this parameter R beta to the R for 2 ratio. So I make sure that the 4 plus and the 2 plus data are, are, are the same as in experiment. And everything else is prediction. Right? Then it's parameter free. So you see if the 6 plus 501.3 kV, 501.4, 8 plus 843.7, 843.2, 200 electron volts difference, 1261.3, 1260.7, 1, 1260.7, electron volts difference, 1745.9, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, zero. Correct, correct. So I, I need the ratio of 4 to 2 in order to fit our beta. And then I need a scale. And the scale, so, so with the scale, here I now give, here I give now energies in KeV, so I have a scale. So then, so you can say I fix the R for 2 ratio, then I get R beta, that is what you will do in the afternoon. And then in order to get the scale, I just fix this scale. I multiply everything by 73.4 KeV, and then I get these numbers. You do the same for uranium 236 that I have shown in the beginning. So now I must go here to the fourth digit in order to, because this, the description is so precise. Um, so I fix these two numbers, 
And then I predict 309.9 .9 for the 6 plus, 522.2 for the 8 plus, which is again <laughs> exact, 782.0, 300 electron volt difference, 1085.0, 1085.2. It's absolutely amazing how well this works, yeah? Mm -hmm. in order to get your uh, data and yes. then you fix all the levels according to the duplex. And then it shouldn't be the, the, the duplex energy, of course, is exact. Yes, I mean yes. Just and the 4 plus energy also. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we just checked it. That's not okay. Yeah, because I've cheated, I've then fixed it here and then... <laughs> 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 it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, yeah. so it's in the fourth digit. So I, I, I fine-tuned it in order to let it, to let it look even better, but I mean, it's just the KV. Well, I love. You, you don't know the beta band there. It, it, will be already, it will not be the experimentally the first excited zero plus state. It's already, these have strongly deformed nuclei. So, so this beta band will be already in these nuclei, at, let's say, from the prediction at 2.6 MeV or so. So you don't know. It only works for the ground band. It only works for the ground band. Uh, in these th rotors, because there, I think, the beta band has never been seen. The beta band is up there. It's not the first excited zero plus state, it will not be the beta band. Because it's, it's squeezed to too high energy already. In this, so, so the CBS works best for the ground band in these nuclei that are strongly deformed. Because the deviations from the rigid road are so small and that I can get them very well by letting the potential uh, have a little width. Well, the width is not so small. Actually, our beta is 0.4. Right? So you have 60% you have still left of the X5, potentially. <coughs> but the deviations are smaller than 1 over 100, 1 over A. I mean, that's really remarkable. You can do this for all these nuclei. This is the relative deviation in the ground band, uh, over the ground band up to the backbending region or so. It's of the order of 10 to the minus 3. Think about... The Balma series, the famous Balma formula, uh, 1 over n squared minus 1 over uh, 4, uh, how quantum mechanics was found, is good to 10 to the minus 4. Not much better. Okay. But actually, the most interesting, so we have an analytic solution for X5. We have an analytic solution for the rigid rotor, which is a rigid rotor. And we have this confined beta soft rotor model, which is now analytic between these things. The most interesting for this model is, of course, something which is far away from X5 and far away from the rigid rotor. So nuclei that have R42 ratios between 2.9 and 3.33, so 3.1. Right? 3.1 is the most interesting for these. And if you look in the nuclear chart, this is some piece of the rare earth region, this prosium up to hafnium tungsten, then you see that for, for these nuclei, this prosium-158, erbium-160, ytterbium-164, hafnium-168, they have R42 ratios of 3.1. So therefore, I've shown you in the beginning, erbium-160, and uh, we have done experiments on this. I mean, that was uh, a couple of years ago, like eight years ago or so. So we have done gamma-ray spectroscopy. I have shown you the data. There is this ground band, there is the excited zero plus band, so you see the zero plus already above the six plus, and there is also a gamma, a gamma band. We have done a, some work on spectroscopy, I will not go into this. Here is the evolution of these structures in erbium isotopes. These are the ground bands from erbium 156 to erbium 164, and here's in the middle is erbium 160 that we are interested in. <coughs> Here's erbium-160, that is the gamma band, K equal 2. And here's the shape phase transitional point. The zero plus is lowest, but this is erbium-160 already beyond the shape phase transitional point. Uh, and we have extended these bands in order to do the to do this uh, comparisons. <coughs> and now comes the interesting thing. So you have seen that this model, because of this of this open potential. That produces, as a, as a uh, function of angular momentum, produces um, a centrifugal stretching. So this is the ground state wave function that you have seen before. And when you 
look then at the wave function of a higher angular momentum state in the ground band, you will see that was the 12 plus, that the wave function has shifted its probability to larger values of beta. That means the higher you spin it, it's more probable that it elongates, right? which you expect also from a, I mean, you, you spin a bubble of uh, water in, in, in the ISS, I mean, then it, see, the higher you spin it, the more it will elongate. You know, that is the, uh, the balance between the centrifugal uh, and uh, forces and the surface tension. So, you have centrifugal stretching and that means that the higher spin states have a larger moment of inertia. And you can then, pl you can take this, mo look at the moment of inertia from these energy differences between the, between the states and compare them to the lowest in the band. So this is moment of inertia from the band head plus two, uh, so, so from any state in the, in, the, in the band compared to the moment of inertia of the lowest state in the band. And you end up with this formula when you plug in the, the rigid rotor value. Um, now when you plug in the I have to write it up. Don't go too far out. So the energy of a state with angular momentum J in the band K is the energy of the band head plus h bar square over 2 theta times jj plus 1 minus kk plus 1. Okay? And if you use this formula in order to get a theta k of j, so this must not be a constant but can vary as a function of angular momentum. So when you have these energies, you can take energy differences and solve for this theta k, for the, for the moment of inertia, for every state. And then you get rid of, <coughs> uh, you, you take relative values. And in the, in the rigid rotor, you would expect that all these moments of inertia are equal. Right? So then you get this, this ratio is always one and constant. The black dots are the data, and the green lines are the result of the confined beta soft rotor. This is for the ground state band. So this is one at angular momentum two. So at the first two plus, that's the, the two to zero gives you the first moment of inertia. So here it is uh, uh, fixed to one, and then in the, the data increase, the rigid rotor would stay at one. So it would be a constant here, flat. <laughs> no centrifugal stretching. And the CBS model with centrifugal stretching gives a green curve. And because we had a very good description of the energies, it follows the data. Right? But it follows the data not only for the ground band. Here, that is in the transition region, we also have the excited beta, the beta band, we have the gamma band. We can do the same for beta and gamma and there's some staggering in the gamma band, but also there the centrifugal stretching is described very well by the model. So that means all these bands stretch alike because it was one parameter, R beta, one potential that describes the stretching. I had to take relative values because the moments of inertia, they are not described correctly. The, the model gives much too large expanded spectrum. I have to take relative values in order to show the centrifugal stretching. The absolute values don't agree for the excited bands. For the ground bands it agrees, but for the excited bands it doesn't. Moments of inertia are a problem. So there's a systematic increase of the relative moments of inertia, so that is centrifugal stretching. And the spin dependence in the ground beta and gamma band are well described in the confined beta soft rotor model with one parameter, which is adjusted to R42. So all bands stretch alike. Uh, that was 160 erbium. The other example was 164 euterbium or 168 hafnium. So for euterbium, we have done the same spectroscopy, ground band, 
Beta band, gamma band. There are the there's the evolution of bands. 164 ytterbium, that is our nucleus here, this one. So here it's less deformed, here's more deformed, so the spectra are compressed. And 162, uh, 164 ytterbium, this is our nucleus, that is a beta band here. And we do exactly the same, centrifugal stretching. Again, the red curve is a CBS fitted to these two points here. And everything else a prediction. The beta band, well, there are some deviations, but it's not so bad. And the gamma band also very good. But you will learn this model in the afternoon. You will also get as a gift, you get a code which you can use to calculate your own nuclei. <coughs> then you want to look at, this was energies only. You want to look at transitions. Uh, E2 transitions, for instance, the E2 operator is uh, alpha 2, the, the quadrupole variable, plus if you really want to make sure that there is a <coughs> Well, you can, you can expand it in alphas. There's a higher, higher order term. Uh, usually this is confined to the first term only, but I want to use also the second term. Uh, when you go into the intrinsic frame, you have, you have a piece with a, a first order alpha, which produces a piece in first order in beta, and the second order alpha produces a piece in second, uh, square in beta. Um, so you have an effective charge in front and then a piece which is uh, proportional to beta and another piece which is proportional to beta square with another constant chi. I want to use this form because this is consistent and comparable to the interacting boson model that you have heard about yesterday where the E2 operator Te2 is an effective charge times the quadrupole operator that contains a chi. And this is an effective charge times, in terms of bosons, that was S dagger D, 1D boson plus D dagger S. So either you create it or you annihilate it, plus a term chi times D dagger D. So when you have coupled to 2, of course, so you have a piece, these D boson operators, there's one D boson in here. This, is, this compares to a term which is proportional to beta. And then you have a, we have a term in the quadrupole operator which has two D bosons. Uh, and that corresponds to a term which is proportional to beta square. And you have this parameter in front. So this is now exactly the form I have here, apart from that I take, that I take here a scale out. But that is, that is fine. I'll just plug it into the effective charge. Here. OK. So then you have the wave functions, and you can calculate E2 transitions. And Excuse me. Yes? I, I'm not following why, of course, now you can beta is linked to these two in an annihilation operation. Well, that would be a lengthy argument. Um, look, in the interacting boson model, these D bosons, they, are, uh, they describe this, this quadrupole uh, uh, deformation oscillation, say. And uh, you, you can show that the number of D bosons in the ground state is proportional to beta square to the, to the square of the quadrupole deformation, um, which is not exactly, which doesn't show you directly that D tilde is, is sort of proportional to beta. But when you go to the coherent state, I hope this is right, then you can show that the effect of D and D dagger is that being proportional to beta. Ah, oh, wonderful. And, and show the formulas that kind of motivate that relationship. Okay. So 
here are comparisons between the CBS and Samari 152 for BE2 transitions and Samari 154 and the CBS. There's no comparison to X5 because it's, far it's already deformed, st more strongly deformed, far away from X5. <coughs> and you see, on average, a very good agreement also for the BE2 values. Well, here there were no data. And, well, in the excited bands, I mean, there was also little data only. But small things are small and something a little bit larger are a little bit larger. Oh, you have the wave function? <laughs> right, um, yeah, that's what I was say. You plug in the operator, integrate. you integrate. Okay. And you do this also in the afternoon, yeah? Oh, beta M is beta W on this. I mean, this was a, yeah. <laughs> I have collected uh, presentations from years. And then one year it was beta W, or one year it was beta great maximum. That was a big M, maxim the maximum beta. And there was a minimum at a small m, yeah? Good question. Maybe we, we were lazy at that point. This <laughs> I, I don't remember anymore. That's, it was years ago. Uh, the CBS, I mean, here, the, the, there is a value missing here. I th no, no, I think, oh, there is an error on the table. I mean, this number ought to be here. It has no error. That, that was the theory. So you see also that goes up, that is a 2, 2 to 4 and 4 to 6, in always the spin up things, they are relatively large. So this is, this is, this is supposed to be here. OK, so that means from, from BE2 measurements, from lifetime values, you see the stretching in the bands. And well, I, I stop about here. Um, <coughs> that is from lifetime measurements, you get the, the transitional quadrupole moment. You can plot it as a, f you can plot it as a function of spin. So this goes up the band. That is from the two to zero. It's normalized. Uh, here's the, here would be the rigid rotor. The green curve is the confined beta soft rotor model, and you see the stretching of the states. The four plus has about the same transitional quadrupole moment, which you get out of the BE two, as the gr as the first two plus. But the six plus with some errors has already a larger qu transitional quadrupole moment. So the, the wave functions stretch. The 8 plus has an even larger transitional quadrupole moment, and the 10 plus even further. And the green curve is the CBS model, and you see how the wave functions stretch, centrifugally stretch. The, the quadrupole moment gets larger, 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 the higher you go up the band. Uh, same set of data for Hafni 168. This is energies, relative moment of inertia. So red crosses are data, green is a CBS model. And here is quadrupole, transitional quadrupole moment. These are the data for the four plus, normalized to two plus, of course. So here four plus has a larger, six plus even larger, eight, ten, and, the, and this faint lines are the, is the CBS model. Okay, 170 half near the same. At this point, I think we all want to have coffee. I will stop and I will not discuss the application of this confined beta soft rotor model to a situation where you have gamma independence. But of course, you can do this there also. In, our <coughs> in the derivation of our formulas, I have assumed a decoupling of beta and gamma variables, which means I have treated the gamma degree of freedom as a, as a uh, harmonic oscillator some with, with some high excitation energy, uh, <coughs> which would not influence then the beta wave function. But I can also use, uh, or obtain a solution where the, the potential in gamma and the triaxiality is completely flat, is in, the potential is independent of gamma. That produces the O5 uh, uh, symmetry. And in this case, I can also then treat the beta variable independently. And that is this O5 confined beta soft rotor, which describes also, of course, the evolution of zero plus states uh, that would cross as a function of R42. But this is a 
would have been another lecture then and I will, I will not go into this now. Okay, do you have questions now? Um, then we can discuss a little bit before we go to the coffee and, and also uh, we can discuss much more in the afternoon. Vic. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Could you go back a couple of slides to the Sumerian 152? You made a point which uh, I, I think is forgotten. You made the comment in looking at the heavier nuclei that the moments of inertia of the excited bands were different, but when you normalize them, the energies worked out very nicely. It's also true in X5. You remember when you pointed out in X5, the excited band, the experimental, the theoretical energies were greatly expanded. Oh, don't go all the way back. Okay. Uh, okay. Theoretical yeah, uh, so the theoretical ones are expanded. But if you normalize the two to zero for the two, then they're in precise accord again. Uh -huh, yeah. Okay. Mm. Now, my, my, that's my comment. My question is this. If a student came to Pete and I with a project and said, I want to try to get a, a nice, simple model for the ERAST energies, you know, it would work reasonably well. We'd say, great. If the student came and said, I want to get a model for the ERAST energies that works to a tenth of a kilovolt, we would tell that student they're crazy. For the ERAST? So the question is, why does it work so well? I mean, it works beyond the level that we're used to. Yes. 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 I, I don't know. It's absolutely amazing. I, I don't know. Because it is close to reality up to the, re up to the backbending region. Oh, no. Well, well there, there, there's another argument. You know, a square well potential cannot be real. But it doesn't matter. The, the, the shape of the potential is not so important at the edges. If you use this potential, or if you use this potential, there's not so, so much of a difference. Because the most, the, the largest part of the wave function is, uh, is inside here. States, yeah, yeah. Which do live out there. Yes, but you know, it breaks down at the backbending region. Of so course. 10 plus 12 plus is anyways the largest but spin you can look so at. Well. It works so well. I don't know. It works. The brilliance of its inventor. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. We have, we have done this systematically. I mean, this, I showed you this irregularity. That, was, that were all nuclei with R42 ratios larger than 3.25 that you can find in the nuclear data sheets. Maybe we have not looked at these super heavies I mean, because there are not too, too many. I mean, they, they don't extend. So actinides and rare earths, R42 larger than 3.25. And all of them, I think all of them to spin 10. And then you do the average Deviation, it's 10 to the minus 3. Yeah? Is it correct to that in the second band, uh, in the model where RB, RB was valid, the ratio 4 to 2 was bigger than 3.32? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is, I don't know, the peculiarity of these Bessel functions. I cannot help it. So here, right? right. It's like 3.37 or so. Uh -huh. Maybe, maybe Mathematica didn't, didn't calculate them accurately enough or to better than a percent. I, I don't know exactly. But the other hand, you, you are getting similar moments of inertia, which is one of the biggest problems of this kind. Hmm? Well, they the more and more you deform them, then, uh, then it becomes more and more rigid, and eventually you come to the rigid rotor. So maybe, I mean, this is also an old figure. Maybe we have to recalculate this again. Um, maybe it's 3.33. So, uh, so you know, it was 3.337 or so. No, you, you didn't, but he did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but this is already a very strongly deformed nucleus. Yeah. But the main problem was its size. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Coffee. 